I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, the kind of work that we're doing on research and practice in deaf blindness within the Canadian environment. So you will hear me talk a lot about the Canadian context, but I will try whenever I can to bring this back either to the clinic or to a more global context. Uh, I also like to make this as non-formal as possible. So if you have a question, if there's something that is not working, you're not understanding, I am moving too fast. If there's an accessibility question about visibility or audibility, please stop me. So anytime, uh, and if I don't see your hand because of the fantastic lighting that I have in me, <laughs> uh, just keep waving until I respond. This is now where the yeah, we see each other. We're good. All right. <laughs> so I thought I should start out with a few words about my life. Um, I have a PhD in neuroscience. I, have, uh, I am a CLVT. Uh, I don't think I can get accreditation credits for the three hours that I'm giving today. <laughs> uh, and uh, I'm a fellow of the American Academy of Optometry, and that explains my life within a school of optometry. So most of my teaching and my research comes out of the world of vision and vision impairment and low vision and blind rehab. Uh, that's also what most of my students in our lab are doing. Uh, but I've always had uh, sort of an affinity towards hearing loss because I did my postdoctoral studies in audiology and so I generally try to make my work as inclusive as possible by having everybody included instead of excluding them from what we're doing because they can't hear us. Uh, one of the big fun pieces of my life in Montreal is that there are two rehabilitation centers. The MAB Mackay Rehabilitation Center, which is officially working in both English and French, and the Institut Nazareth de Louis Braille, which actually works mostly in French. And they provide all sorts of rehabilitation services for hearing and or vision. And I actually am lucky to have rehab space and research space in both of those locations. So my life is divided into three. I have a lab at the university and then two satellite labs in the rehab centers themselves. I'm also an adjunct professor at McGill in OT, which brings me back into the world of how can we facilitate functioning. Uh, I also love the way OTs think in terms of their framework and how work is broken down into its components and how you address these components. So I've always found that very inspirational. And you will also see that there is a part of my research world that is very psychosocial, and that is because I come originally out of experimental psychology and I still have an affiliation to the psychology department at Concordia in Montreal. Uh, as you can guess, my life goes back and forth between English and French all day. So if I, so, and I'm originally from Germany and I'm learning ASL, so if I'm using a language that you don't understand, stop me and I will <laughs> come back to where we're going to. Now, uh, it's sometimes people forget that what we're dealing with is not necessarily very new. I really like this quote, the trend in America is away from blindness as a sole disability. We're increasingly called upon to serve individuals for whom blindness is only one aspect of a more complex and difficult disability configuration. And if you look at your clientele, whether that is children or older adults, um, I'm pretty sure you will agree with this. Well, the interesting part about this is that this quote is from 1965. So this is not new, even though sometimes over the generations we forget. It turns out that the different generations seem to be facing the same problem, and we're still uh, trying to deal with this as best we can. When I approach deaf blindness in general, I like to have a definition that is as inclusive as possible. And the one that I really like is uh, came out of the American Association for the Deaf Blind because it really includes the functional state of the person, their communication abilities, their access to information, their participation abilities, their employment, and their independence. So the definition of dual sensory loss is not so much based for me in their functional objective measures, but in how it affects the person's life. I think that that probably relates to a lot of the people in the room because that is what you deal with. And so this is sort of my starting point for my talk today. I also wanted to touch on a little bit of vocabulary before we get going. Um, and that is because I talked to service providers, administrators, clinicians, all sorts of stakeholders. I talk to researchers, uh, and we don't all use the same vocabulary. And that is sometimes a bit of a barrier for us to work together. Uh, so 
what I want to bring home here is, yes, I usually talk about combined vision and hearing loss because it is a larger philosophical vocabulary that is open to people that don't work in our domain. Uh, dual sensory impairment flies around. What's problematic here is that it doesn't specify which senses. And I've actually had com uh, people work on dual sensory impairment where they're working on touch and taste. And suddenly we were not talking to each other anymore. Uh, acquired deaf blindness is interesting because it already tells us about when this happened in life. But the word deaf blind is not always accessible to everybody because many people with acquired sensory loss are neither deaf nor blind and also don't see themselves as deaf blind. But within the clinic, we often use the term deaf blindness as an umbrella term for all levels of severity. This is also very interesting when you talk to researchers because researchers will prefer a dual sensory loss or combined vision and hearing loss because it doesn't trap them in a corner of the perceptual idea of deafness and blindness. So there are some some barriers still for us to overcome and to think about which words do I use depending on who I'm talking to. Uh, if you're doing fundraising, maybe for fundraising, deaf blindness might be a better term because it sort of conjures up the image of guide dog and cane and children with a lot of trouble doing things. So the checkbook comes out quicker. But if you want to be very specific about the actual level of a functional loss, maybe deaf blindness is not the right term. I don't have an answer for us today, but this is just something that we need to talk about uh, as we go along. Uh, you will find in the handouts for today that there is a document that contains all the references for all the studies that I'm mentioning today. I hope that this works as a resource for you guys when you get back home, especially if you need to justify some of the things that you would like or wouldn't like. Uh, you will see specifically in the demographic part today. Demographics can be super boring, and so I'm trying today to make demographics useful. So you'll see maybe of how some of the references in the handout can be useful for you. Uh, Jesper Dahlmeier in Copenhagen pr uh, prepared this paper a little while ago that I really like in terms of his approach to terminology. And one of the things he did is that he put together this really nice way of visualizing the complexity of deaf blindness research and its service delivery as well, because this is often how the services are divided or that the, the specialties are divided. Do you work with people that have an acquired or a congenital impairment? You may have to have a slightly different approach to your service delivery depending on the onset. Is it a partial loss? Is it a full loss? And so I find this, this splits it nicely down. Of course, what I'm focusing on to, but today mostly is acquired vision and hearing impairment where there is some residual hearing and vision, which is what you really see in your standard older adult with AMD and presbycusis. So the big wave of people that are about to come into our system will fall into this category. But there are many, many others. Actually, we were discussing earlier, there's a guy in England by the name of Peter Simcock who specializes working in older adults who have been congenitally blind all their, uh, deaf blind all their life. So these are people over 65 with syndrome X or Y that are now, that have enough of a lifespan to grow old with their congenital impairment. But their rehabilitation and assistive needs are very different than somebody where this impairment developed after the age of 70 or 80. So it's a smaller population, but a very different population. And we know almost nothing about these people. So what I'm going to do today is I have three different stories. And depending on how it works, I'm sort of going to spend 45 minutes or so on each of those stories. But if you have a question or anything, I would rather shorten my stories and engage a little bit with you in case you have something you would like to share or say. So I'll start out with my little not boring demographic story. We'll see who, how that works out. I want to talk a little bit about the use of assistive devices. And finally, my psychosocial side, I want to talk about stigma a little bit. Since I'm from Canada, I thought I should show you how uh, aging works out in Canada right now. And it turns out our general 
calculation is take all our Canadian statistics to multiply by 10 and you end up with American statistics. Or you do this the other way around. If somebody comes around with uh, some American statistics, we take 10% and that's us. It's very, very similar. And so here what you have is a classic population pyramid for males and females in Canada where the blue line is the population in 1971. So this is the bump of the baby boomers here. So you have the frequency of people and the actual population in 2010, you can see how this has moved up. It has shrunk a little bit. People die as they get older, but the bump of the baby boomers is very visible. So they are now, uh, in, actually in 2010 was the first year that the baby boom, the first of the baby boomers reached retirement age. So they're about to move into the retirement pool. Now there are different ways of looking at these data. This, for example, was a prediction by Statistics Canada of the proportion of the population over 65 and under the age of 14. And the prediction was that somewhere in 2016, Canada will have more people over 65 than they have under the age of 16. It turned out that in September 2015 is when that actually happened. It happened a little earlier than predicted. So we now, uh, this is new. This is a completely new way of looking at how our population is distributed. The kind of people you meet on the street. You are more likely to meet somebody over 65 than under the age of 16. Huh? Now, in reality, that is not necessarily the case if you're in a bigger city, because there will be less older people and more younger people. But we're looking at a global scale here. This is probably my favorite way of looking at exactly the same data. These are, this is the frequency or the number of people over the age of 100. These are the centenarians. So right now, we have just under 8,000 centenarians in Canada, which means you have roughly 80,000 in the States. And this is what the prediction is in terms of the number of men and women over the age of 100 within your career, right? This is, this is all happening within our lifetime, uh, depending on where you are in your career. But for most of the people in the room, this is happening within your lifetime. Now, for those of you who have clients that are centenarians already, you know that there is a level of fragility. There is a, a level of service delivery that is just a little bit different because this is end of life care. Well, or not, huh? because Maybe the end of life here is really changing. There was an article a while ago in um, Times, I think, that the first person to live 200 years is probably already born. Uh, but it's, again, a prediction, right? Our lifespan is expanding quickly, and our way of maintaining our lives is changing rapidly. So depending on how it works out, I might be in here somewhere. This, uh, this is not a list that uh, I'm going to discuss very uh, detailed, but all of these references are in your reference list in case you want to go back here. I uh, asked one of my students to look into proportions of people with dual sensory impairment, older people that have combined vision and hearing loss. And so the percentages vary widely depending on what population you're looking at. 30% if you look at frail older adults, 88% if you look at hospitalized people with hip fractures. It's in different countries, in different populations, different percentages. Uh, but here, we're looking at objective measures of vision and hearing. I'm talking about acuities. I'm talking about uh, decibel hearing thresholds. The second page here is actually self-report measures. So here we're not looking at measures of vision or hearing. We're looking at questions of how people define their own visual status. Do you have trouble with? So this is a little bit different. You will see that in some cases these proportions are a little bit lower. In some of them they're a little bit higher. Like for example, here we're looking at nursing home residents. What I also find interesting in here is of course the potential impact of other factors like cognitive aging. Maybe somebody's judgment of their cognitive, of their vision and their hearing status may be influenced by their cognitive status as well. So that is not necessarily considered in these studies. But it's an interesting reflection to look at as well. So we have an interesting, unique opportunity in Montreal. And this is based on one of the papers that is actually available in your package. 
So I'll talk about this a little bit more. In uh, studies in the past, uh, different researchers have attempted to look at and find the population with dual sensory loss. So this is not easy. These people are not easy to reach. Right? That's really a little bit of a problem because you may put something on the radio, they may not hear it. You put something in the newspaper, they may not see it. And so finding people with dual sensory loss, reaching out to them, and in the case of research, recruiting them is not always obvious. Uh, what Monroe did in the, in the 90s is that they literally went to hospitals, to rehab centers, to community centers, to ask people, do you know anybody with? And so the, uh, their attempt went relatively well, but it turns out that in terms of the proportion of people that they found, uh, the large majority were people working age. And one of the reasons for this is that one of their main sources of finding these people was through the Ushers Association. And so these people are very organized. Many of these people have their dual sensory impairment start during their adult, their working years. And so there is uh, a more of a, an ability for them to organize themselves and to group together. So Usher organizations are often very strong. If you look at some of the groups in Facebook, for example, the Usher group is huge. There's one support group that has over 8,000 members. Uh, so these people find each other. And it, I think it's a little bit linked to their age. They repl replicated this uh, study in 2005, and now something changed. The proportion shifted more towards aging, and that was because they found different ways of accessing retirement and rehabilitation sources. And so suddenly the older population was more visible. Specifically, this proportion was very high in the Quebec subsample, but that was linked to the fact that in Quebec, for example, rehabilitation services for sensory loss are free in terms of cost to the client. So they are more likely to be identified through the rehabilitation system because they are already in the system. So the government can find them for you. I will come back to this because I will compare the proportion that we found to those previous studies. So we created something that I call dual sensory space. Uh, you can use any measure. This can be an objective measure, like here we have visual acuity versus hearing loss. But it could be a self-report measure of how severely you judge your hearing loss or your vision loss. Or it could be a score on a screening questionnaire, whereby if people score in the normal range, they would fall down here at the, at the bottom left corner. But if they are increasing in either their vision or their hearing loss, you would find the truly deafblind up here in the corner. So this is one way of looking at dual sensory impairment. The, the reason we chose this is that this actually corresponds to the way Quebec organizes its eligibility criteria for rehabilitation services in deaf blindness. And so here we have different levels of uh, average hearing loss. Are people in the room familiar with how decibel hearing loss uh, is calculated in terms of dual sensory impairment. Who has no idea how this works? Because I don't mind spending three, okay, I'll spend three or four seconds on that. So if you are measuring an audiogram, then in the audiogram you will have across the bottom the frequency of the tone that you're testing. So these are pure tone averages that are calculated for the right ear and for the left ear. As you go up, your hearing actually gets better. So there's a zero at the top and then maybe a hundred at the bottom, 110. If you have an average decibel hearing loss of 100 or 110 decibels, then you are profoundly deaf. If you have a value around zero or 10, maybe 15 or 20, that is probably the kind of hearing that we have here in the room. If you now look across the frequencies, it often happens that for older adults, these values are in the normal range for the low frequencies. But as you go to the higher frequencies, that hearing drops off. But the number that we're looking at here is when you look across the frequency, you average those dots. So they may have good hearing at a low frequency, very poor hearing at a high frequency, the average value is somewhere in the middle of those. And if that value is around 40 decibel, so you may have 100 at high and zero at low, your average may be around 40 or 50, 
then you're considered having a mild hearing impairment. It's very deceiving, really, because it means that at some frequency you are profoundly deaf, but in other frequencies you function well. Uh, in hearing rehab, we call this often the daughter-in-law syndrome, because female voices are often higher in the frequencies, which means they fall at the end that is not audible. But the son, they can still hear because the voice is lower. And so even in the clinic, this will happen that they call me in to communicate with somebody where some of our female staff may not be audible to them anymore, but they can still hear the male staff. So if you have trouble like this, try lowering a register when you speak and see what happens. So that explains a little bit what goes on on the bottom here. This, uh, the y-axis is probably more intuitive to you. These are uh, normal visual fields or normal visual acuity. And as you go up, you slowly approach legal or total blindness as you go up. So the truly deafblind, again, would be over here without any vision or hearing. We have three rehab centers in Montreal that deal with these impairments. And some of them do more than one impairment. Some of them only do one. They all differ in the languages that they serve people in, but for our purposes, that didn't really make a difference. And again, the advantage here is that all these people can receive their services for free if they are uh, residents of Quebec. So there is no barrier to access on the financial uh, uh, level. I wanted to quickly run through some of these eligibility criteria, because of course, all of this is usually with the better eye with standard optical correction. Uh, for us, this is around 2070 eligibility. If it's 2060 and you have a progressive disease like AMD, then you are also eligible for devices, for example, in this case, if you have a visual field of less than 60 degrees, or if you have some type of hemianopsia, then you're automatically included and you can access these services. For hearing, uh, something interesting happens. So here we're now calculating this famous decibel hearing loss, this uh, average across these frequencies, which are 5, 1, 0 0.5, 1, 2, and 4 kilohertz, and in the better ear, but without hearing aid. Right? So this is your natural hearing without hearing aid. If it's in children, and if there is a threat to language development, we are not interested in the level of hearing loss. If there is a threat to language development, they are immediately included. If we're looking at youth that are in school, if acquisition of information is threatened, that is usually immediately eligible, and that is as low as 25 decibel in the better ear. If you look at working age adults, that is similar because we want to facilitate employment. And then what's very fascinating is that there is also a category that if there is a functional ability that you are not able to do, no matter what it is, you're eligible for services. You're not eligible for devices, but you can come in, learn coping strategies. You may even, you may want some psychosocial support. So there are some services that you can access at ne never mind which level if there is a functional threat to something. In the vision categories, we don't have that, and we're trying to get there. So what we ended up doing is we went around town and we found all the files, electronic and paper, of all these people in these rehabilitation programs for vision and hearing loss from age 0 to 100 and plus, because there were quite a few over the age of 100. We ended up finding 614 charts. Some of them lived more than 75 kilometers away from Montreal because they only came to Montreal for a specific service. So we didn't really consider them part of the greater Montreal region. Uh, left us with 564 dossiers, most of them female, ranging from four months to 105 years. And so the data that I want to show you today is from those files. Here's the age distribution. It's not surprising that we have more women. Uh, there, well, one is they live longer. That's just a blessing that you have as, a, as our kind. Uh, there is another factor in there. I think that men are less likely to seek help. And so this uh, imbalance here is maybe a little larger than you would usually expect because I don't think that men are all that hungry to go to rehab. What I also find interesting is that when you look at the distribution of the younger generation, uh, there are some at each age. And when we look a little bit closer, these are mostly syndromes, genetic syndromes, that are relatively stable in the population. And so they exist across all of these age groups 
relatively equally, they, we seem to have more on the male side. So some of these may be X-linked conditions. And so now when we put that back into the data that I showed you earlier, uh, the distribution now of the older adults is growing more and more. So I'm really only looking at the comparison between 2005 and 2010, but this is why we did the study in 2010. This is now when the baby boomers reach retirement age, so they are slowly entering into this calculation. So if I now plot these people in dual sensory space, what happens? I'm looking at their average hearing loss versus their visual acuity. And I look at the region of the graph where I would find the truly deafblind, and I don't have a lot of them. Right? They're very few. It's less than 0.1% of people that are actually truly deafblind in this population here. And then I have this bizarre group down here whose vision is actually normal. Huh? All sorts of levels of hearing loss, but the vision is normal. Would anybody venture a guess of who this might be? No, good thought, but no. Who would be deafblind and have completely normal visual acuity? Brain related vision? No. Usher. Usher. This is the gang with Usher syndrome. These are people with very restricted fields and fantastic acuity but can't get around to save their lives, right? So this is it's a whole different population. And then you've got this blob in the middle. Could you guess who that is? They have lost some hearing, they have lost some vision. Those are the older adults, right? So this is really interesting to see where they fall. If we now do the same picture, but we go by visual field, this is where we find most of the people that we consider deafblind, and again, this is the Usher gang. So these are people with highly restricted fields. Still, you will see that there are very few people that actually have no field and no vision, right? No vision, no hearing. It's a very small group, uh, but they do exist. And again, we've got this blob in the middle. These are people that have some field loss, some hearing loss, and that's your older gang. So what's the carry away from this, really, is that these people have enough residual vision and hearing that you can rehabilitate them, that you can work with these people in a, in a very specific way. If we now look at aging, you know, here you see the big division of some of these people are legally blind, but some of them are not. Uh, it's roughly half and half. There are very few in the older gang that are really truly blind. And if we do the same thing with visual field, you will see that most of them actually have uh, normal visual fields here, the axis is unfortunately upside down. So above the line is a larger field. So there are some people with visual field loss, but most of them actually have fields that we would still consider normal. And then you've got the same thing if we look at hearing loss here. Most of the people are on the good side of hearing loss. Right? They are not profoundly deaf. They have some hearing loss, but it's it's not lost. You can, for example, what's interesting when we recruit with most of these people, we can still communicate verbally quite well. Uh, you may have to adjust your techniques of communication. I will come back to that a little later. But you can communicate without having to really change the way you do business. Then we did something fun. We looked at the diagnostic criteria of these people. and. The first thing that jumped out to me that was very odd is this group up here. We have 12% of these people have no diagnosis. So I thought, ah, that's weird. That's kind of odd. What's going on there? So I talked to our staff. And so a small percentage of that are people that are so new to the filing system that the diagnosis hasn't arrived yet. But that's maybe a percent or so. These are just new referrals that haven't been fully pro processed yet. So I said, what's going on with the other 11%? So we ended up going to back to some of those files and we asked the staff, why is this? And so one of our staff members said something, because she, I, I think she didn't feel like spending the time with me either. And so she said, well, you know, what is that going to make a difference, right? I rehabilitate these people based on what their functional impairment is. I don't really care uh, what their diagnosis is. It doesn't do anything for me. And I had to think about that a little bit. And so it turns out that the other 11% are files that have been in our system for more than 30 years. And so these are people that 
may have a syndrome that we can now diagnose, but 30, 40 years ago, they were never diagnosed. They were just deaf and blind, and that's the end of the story, sent them to the rehab center. And the rehab professionals don't really care what the diagnosis is because there's lots to do. Can you do this at home? Can you do that at home? What are your functional goals? Nobody will ever ask you, what's your diagnosis? Right? It, it doesn't play into that because it doesn't actually matter. So this, this is an interesting different way of looking at things because in the hospital, nothing moves unless you've got that code checked off, right? Hmm. And in our world, that is very different. And I, I find that that's also sometimes a communication problem, you know, that in the difference between the medical system and the rehabilitation system, sometimes uh, different people get caught on different pieces of information. And here, the diagnosis is not really such a big issue. Is this something that you, like I see some heads nodding, but if somebody disagree with me, please openly disagree with me. I'm always curious about other people's opinion in this context. So then, the first thing that jumps out is, of course, that there's a third based on two diagnoses, AMD and presbycusis. If you're not sure, presbycusis is simply age-related sensory neural hearing loss. It's often uh, noise-induced. Uh, with time, the hair cells in the ear will go. And so that is called presbycusis. There is a suspicion that we will have a wave of presbycusis in about 20 to 30 years induced by Walkman and headphones because people listen to music at a level that is above recommended, uh, which right now, if you're between 12 and 40, it won't matter. But once you hit 60, after having 40 years of exposure, you will fall into the presbycusis file. And then you've got another 20%, roughly, of other age-related things. That includes glaucoma and things of that kind. Diabetic retinopathy is in there. So that gives you half of this population based on age-related things. Right? And then you've got Usher, which is interesting because in Quebec, this percentage is higher than anywhere else in North America. Uh, this is due to a founder's effect, whereby some of the French immigrants actually brought a gene into the French gene pool in Quebec that, because of the language limitations, has maintained itself within Quebec. And so there are entire family trees for geneticists are having a wonderful time with this because they can track this over generations. It doesn't really help the population that much, uh, but you know scientists get excited about these things. And so this proportion of 20% is higher than what you would find anywhere else in North America, simply because of the language issues. There are categories about congenital complications, uh, non-congenital complications. Uh, the related to prematurity part is now very small. That used to be a lot larger. And that's really the effect of advances in medical treatment. So that's good to see. Throw a mini story in here. In the non-congenital uh, complications, was a case of uh, somebody that really touched me. You know, I haven't met any of these people, of course. I only met their dossiers. But uh, as a low vision therapist, I find it interesting that the pieces, that the people that go under my skin are usually the ones that are close to me in age. Because I see where I am in life, and I see where they are in life, and I make a very direct comparison. I find that very interesting, that that really still gets me. And so the one file that caught me uh, the most strongly in this review was actually the file of somebody who um, was born prematurely because of a car accident. The mother was in a car accident. During this car accident, there was some trauma to the brain. And so there was cognitive loss that came with the premature birth. As this person grew up, it turns out that the gene for retinitis pigmentosa was present, so this person ended up losing peripheral vision because of RP. Was then treated for various things and had an uh, allergic reaction to the anesthetic and therefore lost their hearing. So you're, you're reading this and you're going, how unlucky can one person really get in their one lifetime? So at the age of 15, Various rehabilitation goals were established, and one central goal was to be able to express 
when this person is hungry, when this person needs to sleep or is tired, and when this person needs to go to the bathroom. And at the age of 39, that person attained that goal. Exactly. And so when I was reading through this, going, oh my god. This is, you know, this is a complicated and complex population. This is not, like, you have to have the right center for yourself and within yourself to work with these people. And hat off to all of you who choose this path. It's a, it's a challenging path. So the summary of the study basically to take home now is, of course, the large percentage of these people are over the age of 65. 43% uh, of them were over the age of 85. So we sat back and we looked a little bit at these numbers. And I'm thinking, wow, this really means that these are the parents of the baby boomer generation. So now just imagine what will happen to this picture in 20 years. Right? This is really wild. And this is why one of the reasons why in your package you have the references for the demographics, for example, for most of these demographic studies. Because one of my missions for you, should you choose to accept this, <laughs> is to go back to your administrations and to discuss the implications of these demographics on your service delivery. Because now would be the time to prepare the level of resources that we will need by then in order to do what we do now. Uh, I think that this population is not necessarily easily going to arrive at the doorstep. I think also that in 20 years they will be slightly different. They will have different expectations. Um, they may want to have their iPad or their whatever as their rehabilitation tool, right? They also may want their rehabilitation now instead of waiting for it. They may be will willing and capable to pay for it right now. Right? So there may be a whole different dynamic that enters the way we provide our services. And I think that we slowly now need to think about that. So when it arrives, it doesn't just come like a surprise. I am here to tell you this is coming. So we'll, we'll see how it unfolds. So I think that the the uniqueness about their profile in terms of their sensory loss allows us to think more about the unique type of interaction you can have with them, especially the older adults. I think that I'm drawn to working with them because I can communicate with them differently than I can with kids. I'm more an older people guy than I am a kids guy. So uh, which determines why I do research with older adults. That would make sense. Uh, and I find when they get engaged in their own rehabilitation, when you can motivate them, you can communicate, you can bring this to them, you know, they can process this. I find that very interesting and very exciting when they themselves engage in, aha, I see what you mean, right? And so this is what's really unique when you now suddenly face them with a cognitive impairment because then part of that may be with you at the beginning of your rehab intervention and it may slowly shift over a period of years as the cognitive impairment may take hold. Uh, I will talk more later on about the psychosocial implications of this as well, but I find it always most difficult in the period where they understand that this is coming and they're very anxious about and, and fearful about what's coming, but they're still capable of processing this. You know, the rehab process changes completely when you don't have to worry about that anxiety anymore because they will have forgotten tomorrow morning what was going on. But before that, there's a lot of work to be done. The other thing, of course, now that I'm talking about cognition, most of the people in this context don't just have a cognitive impairment, but there's a motor thing, there's some you know, dexterity things, there's arthritis, there's the knees are going, the heart is going, the lungs are not what they used to be. So there's this whole complexity. And I wish I could give you instructions on what to do on vision and hearing if. But the thing is that that doesn't really work so far. There is, I think that we need to have a certain level of openness for complexity and willingness to improvise a little bit on the fly because you may discover issues while you're addressing the hearing and the vision, you come across seven other things that you go, oh dear, you know, what, now what are we going to do? Well, 
see what you can come up with. There's, I think time will be your aid, time will be your assistance in learning from each client to make your intervention for the next client better. Because nobody will be able to do this in one shot. This will take some time to understand them. But they can be rehabilitated. That is really the mission here. Uh, I think that we sometimes get a little bit overwhelmed at the beginning by the complexity of that population. But it is possible. Just hang in there. And nobody is going to do this alone. We will need to do this within the team approaches that we often have in the rehab settings anyway. So now I want to take you into this question of if we do engage in rehabilitation interventions with this population, does this actually work and do we actually make the difference that we want to make? And so this example that I've chosen in this case is uh, the interventions using hearing devices in people that also have a vision loss. And are these people actually capable of seeing? Is the visibility of these hearing devices uh, sufficient. Uh, again, this is one of the articles that is in your package. In case you want to read the entire story, you can go very deep. Now, my approach to assistive devices is very large. Uh, I like the definition of the World Health Organization that this is really any tool that will allow people to complete a certain task. We have uh, very interesting discussions within the rehab uh, staff at our center, how far to extend this. For example, would you consider a guide dog an assistive device? Uh, I personally do. Uh, would you consider a spouse an assistive device? And I think in many cases that may be the case. Uh, we have interesting cases when people that have been well rehabilitated from our perspective don't come to their, our services for some time because everything is working well, but they show up and the spouse dies because their main assistive device has disappeared. And so now we have to reorganize and restart in a different way in order to reintegrate these people into their lives, but in a much more autonomous way. And that is often a very big challenge, especially when they're so used to that device that is within hollering distance. <laughs> so uh, if you look a little bit at the previous work in hearing and in vision, one in four people are eligible, that are eligible to use a hearing aid, actually do so. It's only a quarter of the people that are actually using, that are eligible, do use a hearing aid. That's pretty terrible. There are many reasons why this is. One of them is that, of course, the hearing aids are evil uh, because they make you potentially look older. Right? This is a big issue. And I find it's always fascinating to see how much time and energy people will spend to hide their device. And we'll come back to this in the stigma context later. Uh, one in seven with a hearing loss actually use a hearing assistive technology. Uh, the differentiation here is that hearing aids are sort of their own thing, their own category. Hearing assistive technologies is anything else that will facilitate an activity for somebody who is hearing impaired. For example, you will see later on an image of a vibrating alarm clock. So these are pads that you can put under a pillow and instead of a sound alarm for uh, you waking up in the morning, your pillow will start vibrating. because. These are people that don't necessarily hear the alarm. So those are considered hearing assistive technologies. Uh, some of them could be loop systems within the conference room, for example. So these are any things that are not hearing aids. Uh, if you look at vision, there is actually not as much available in terms of research about device use and abandonment as I thought. Uh, one in four devices, relatively, depending on who you look at, are abandoned. They end up in a drawer. And one in four users will think that the devices that they have don't actually do what they want them to do. Now, I think that these numbers might be a little small. I think that uh, this is really in very specific contexts of research. I have a feeling that in real life, this looks quite different. And not surprisingly, there is nothing out there about device abandonment in dual sensory impairment. And one of the reasons why there is nothing out there, that actually has to do with the difficulty of studying people with dual sensory loss. How do you recruit them? How do you communicate with them? 
uh, you know, how do you measure what it is you're wanting to measure? And many people that come from either vision or hearing only don't know how to deal with the other impairment. There are very few of us that really have chosen to open this door to study both vision and hearing in parallel because we need to know twice as much in a way. I guess you, you have to uh, venture into a field that you didn't start out in so that not everybody is comfortable in doing that. So the other thing about these devices is that they're usually designed with one impairment in mind. A hearing aid is built to help you hear. It's also built to be invisible because of course the hearing aid people know that you don't want it if it is huge. So they become smaller and smaller and then we send it to Japan and we make them even smaller and then they come back from Japan and then you can barely see it anymore and then you might consider buying it and then you have low vision and you're asked to exchange the battery and it all ends. Right? So my favorite one also is that uh, they are usually beige or whatever skin color. So if this is your own skin color and the air the aid is the skin color, suddenly you've got a fantastic contrast situation in your hand and you're trying to find a T-switch and you have no idea what's happening. So this is, this is tough. Uh, I will show you in a moment what a pocket talker is. And so changing batteries on a pocket talker is not obvious either. Uh, does anybody in the room actually have a pocket talker in their lab or clinic? There's one over here, a second one over there. Not a lot. When you're on your way home tonight or tomorrow or you're online to shop, buy a pocket talker. I have no uh, connection to any companies that make them. I don't care which brand you buy, but you will see in a moment this is the coolest thing you will ever have if you're dealing with older adults that have a hearing loss. Many of them will leave the hearing aid at home anyway. So when they show up, there is a communication issue and your pocket talker may fix this. So let's explain what is a pocket talker. Uh, Let's do this right now. Uh, it looks like an old-style Walkman. So it's a little box, not much bigger than a phone, but it's thicker usually. And it has a plug-in at the top for a directional microphone. So you can point this microphone at whoever is talking because it will selectively only work in the direction that you're pointing it. And it has a second plug-in for a headset. So you can put in a regular you know, iPhone headset or something more advanced that will block noise and that person now has control over the volume button and can point this at you and if they can't hear you they can crank you up selectively and if they can hear you better they can turn this a little down but they can only use this in this situation so if you have a clinic and you never know if somebody can hear you or not pull out the pocket talk and say try this maybe that will make your rehab intervention a lot faster and a lot clearer and you actually can see whether these people can understand what you just said. So this will revolutionize your service uh, provision to older adults that have forgotten their hearing aid or where the battery is dead or they don't know yet that they actually have a hearing loss. So here, for example, is a big picture of one of those vibrating alarm clocks. So this is the pad that lives underneath your pillow. Here is the user who is using a magnifying glass in order to figure out whether the alarm is set, and so it turns out the designer got really smart and created a large blinking time display. Yes. Well, once a year, no, twice a year, you have to change the time for daylight savings. And once in a while, you may want to fix the time at which you actually get up to a different time. And those buttons are over here. All right, so this is super non-visible. With or without magnifier, this is not accessible. Uh, something that is also very common is that you will look at talking clocks, for example, and when you turn them around to see where you can adjust the time, it's only doable tactile because it's a black relief. Like everything is black with black numbers. It just sticks up a little bit so you can see where the numbers are and you have to sort of use your finger to turn. If you have neuropathy, forget that, right? Not going to happen. There are a couple of factors that will affect the usability of any device. I mean, in this case, I'm looking at the hearing devices, but this applies to anything, a vision, a hearing, a mobility, a communication device. Visibility and legibility are huge. We'll come back to this in a second. Uh, dexterity plays a big role, especially if you look at older adults, if you're dealing with neuropathy, if you're dealing with a mild tremor, it doesn't have to be much. 
But if there's a mild tremor, it will change the way this person can interact with this device. If there is arthritis and it doesn't quite bend the way it used to, grabbing things, uh, this is all going to be a challenge. The complexity of interacting with this device needs to be considered. The motor complexity is linked a little bit to dexterity, but the cognitive complexity is also very important. I will talk a little bit more about some of the language that I learned from uh, human factors world because they are very interested in this human machine interface. So if you look at visibility and legibility, the people that have really done most of the work and have had most of the success with it are people that built devices for the care, or <coughs> mostly the self-care, of uh, diabetes. And so here, for example, I give you three examples of uh, um, blood glucose meters. Um, I would think that you, it's obvious over here there's a glare issue. Right? They've chosen to do a beautiful design with something that's reflective. Bad idea. Here are potential contrast issues. Uh, the design itself, it, you'd see, like this is a, it's designed by 19-year-olds for 19-year-olds. Right? This is always problematic that the, the generation that is working on the new technology is not the generation that is using it. Uh, so there are potential glare and contrast issues here. This one I actually like the most because you've got large numbers, you've got relatively good contrast. Because of the type of screen it is, I wonder if you actually have control over the device. Maybe you can ask it to be black on white or white on black. And so this is actually very interesting. If you choose a device, if you make a recommendation for a device, one of the things I look for very early on is whether the device allows you to control the displays whatever it may be. Can you make the, larger, the number larger? Can you change the contrast? Can you add color or get rid of color altogether? Because no two clients are going to be the same. So if you have this option, and I, this will give also a sense of control to the user. You know, suddenly, they can own this because they are going to make it what they want it to be. So it really is not so much something that you tell them to use, but that you give them the option of manipulating. That usually makes a big difference. If you look at dexterity, there is some very interesting work. Of, of course, no talk at Envision without a picture of uh, George Timberlake. Uh, it, what is George's title here? His scientific advisor? He wears many hats. He has many hats. So he is the man of many hats. He's also wearing one for his own research project. He is <laughs> very involved in low vision research. He is the father of the term PRL. Uh, peripheral uh, retinal, preferred retinal locus. So if you've heard that before, uh, George Timberlake is actually the person who came up with that term some time ago. And so he's done uh, a little bit of research on uh, reaching and grasping, there, uh, in this case with macular degeneration. And to the clinicians, this is not going to be a big surprise that somebody who has central visual impairment will grasp things differently. It will be slower. Uh, of course, scientists get all excited about measures that are not necessarily all that relevant. But I find it very interesting that, for example, in this case, people will create a larger aperture with their hand before they reach something, right? because they want to make sure that whatever they are reaching for actually falls within their grasp. Because if the hand's not wide enough, you may touch it before you can grasp it, it may move, it may fall over. So they're taking safety routes, right? They're making automatic adjustments. They may actually choose to reach with both hands instead of something that they used to do with one hand, just to be sure, because you want to avoid accidents at any cost. That means you have to allocate additional resources to whatever used to be easy, right? This will make you slower, it will potentially waste time that you may not need to use, right? And resources. It's all about resources. I think that as we get older, it really all becomes about how much time and energy will I invest in this? Because then that means I won't be doing that. And that choice is rough. And I think that that is why many people end up coming to rehab, to find better ways of making that choice or saving resources to be able to just go for it without having to think about it as much. Motor complexity, I thought, well, you know, how complicated can things be, right? I mean, how hard is it? This is me being my age. 
And so I started reading a little bit more about it. And so when you look at assistive device work, in this case, so I found a study that looked at computer use, simply double clicking on a mouse or on a key, on a tab, on a touch tab, is already considered a complex motor task for many older people. Because processing speed is not the same, because manual control is not the same. And so if you have a setup at a rehab center where you're teaching somebody to use a computer, one of the things you may have to do at the very beginning is change that time period within which a double click is considered a double click and not two single clicks. That's such a tiny thing. But if you suddenly can't double click something because you're too slow, your entire intervention is not going to work anymore. So these are small things, but they make a huge difference. And so, of course, then what happens is that, again, things take more time. Errors come in. Errors will create frustration. Frustration will cause abandonment, not only of this device, but also of the service. Right? You're doing yourself a favor if you're slowing down a bit in what it is you want these people to do, because there's a better chance that they will actually stay with you. Because if there's even a hint of a stressor at the beginning, they may not come back. And that's tricky. It's just really, it's interesting here because in the States, many of the OTs, for example, are reimbursed by time and service delivered, right? So this is a bigger consideration for you than it is for us in Canada because the service is paid anyway. Whether I spend half an hour with you or two hours or whether I make one follow-up or ten, it's my call. Luxury, huh, when you really think about it. Uh, so I'm not too worried about that, but I'm still worried about them getting bored or frustrated because they may still, even if it's free, they may not come back because they may still say, well, that's worth nothing, right? It's free. So <laughs> whichever way you're on of this fence can work against you. So being sensitive to this is going to be very useful. Uh, in human factors, there's something called production rules. Does anybody know what that is? Have you heard this term before? Production rules. So production rules refers to the sequence of events necessary to accomplish something. So for example, I am an iPad user. And in the first version of the iPhone user as well, so in the first version of the, uh, uh, the um, software to go onto airplane mode, I would have to turn it on. And then I go to general and then to settings. Then I had to go to the Wi-Fi and I had to turn off. So there are six things I need to do in order. In the newest version now, all I have to do is swipe up and the button is right there and I can go to airplane mode. So the production rules have been simplified in the newest version of the software, but they used to be more complicated in the older version. So this is what we mean by what are the steps needed for you to get to where you need to go. The least complex version of this is going to be the most useful for people where complexity at a cognitive level is an issue. And the moment you c it becomes sort of this battle between the cognitive resources and the cognitive requirements. Again, there is no easy solution to this because it is up to you as a clinician, as a service provider, as a rehab intervention person to judge that. And often you have to judge that on the fly because you may not have the luxury of doing a two and a half hour cognitive evaluation in order to know exactly what the resources are. No, you watch, you observe, and is it a day where this person is tired? Is it because it's Friday afternoon and you're tired? Is, you know, all of this needs to be judged. It's, it's this complicated work, there's no doubt about it. So we decided to ask a couple of questions. What proportions of older adults with a visual impairment can actually utilize assistive devices that are designed for hearing loss? Which kind of characteristics of these clients can actually predict their user success? And can we intervene somehow and increase this success if we have them simply repeat the task or if we actually give them some instruction and some strategy traditional rehab intervention to do this. I'm going to be very curious because I'm going to venture onto thin ice with you guys because I may tell you something that you may not like. So we'll see how this goes. 
We ended up recruiting 61 people from one of our rehab centers, uh, mostly AMD, most you know, all of them over 65, uh, all, of, all of them over 60. There was a group of people that only had a vision impairment who don't actually interact with hearing devices yet or ever. We have a group of people that already use hearing devices, but it turns out by accident, none of the devices that we were using in the study. And then we have a, a control group, I call them the, the repeat group. I'll come to the repeat group in a second. We ran them all through the Montreal Cognitive Assessment, which is a screening tool, because I'm always interested whether cognition, how to which level cognition may need to be considered. The MOCA is very hard. It's a very difficult test. So even non-cognitively impaired people, in the older gang there's usually one or two percent that will fail that on a Friday afternoon because they're tired. So this is a, a difficult test to do. And then we did the Purdue PEG board, which is a manual test of dexterity. I'm not, some of you may be familiar with that, but we were simply interested in knowing more about their ability to manipulate the devices. What did we have them to? First task was to assemble a pocket talker. So here you see the microphone, the directional microphone, and then you plug in your headset, and then up in here is a little wheel where you can adjust the volume. And the task was plug in the microphone, plug in the headset, and set the volume to three, which is more or less middle of the road. Second task, use an amplified telephone. So here, the piece of info that's important is that there's an extra button at the bottom in the center that amplifies the signal at your command. So you can make a phone call. If you can't hear well, you press the amplification button to bring the sound up. So the task was pick up the phone, dial your own phone number, amplify the call by pressing the amplification button, and hang up. There were two conditions. One condition is what I call the Walter condition. Uh, if you're anything like me, if you get a new assistive device, technology, an iPhone, I don't what, you take it out of the box, you turn it on. If it doesn't work, you may consider looking at the instructions. <laughs> this is an image of the quick guide for one of the amplified telephones that we were using in the study. Okay, it's ridiculous, right? It's the quick guide. It comes with another book that's an inch thick that gives you the detailed instructions. So we thought, okay, never mind. We're simply going to try the Walter condition where we provide the bit to our participants and tell them what to do. And the second condition was what we call the mini intervention. You're going to love this. So we found somebody who is not a rehabilitation professional. It's a research assistant who over time now has picked up a little bit of what we do, but this is not a trained person. And we asked him to show what to do once. Here's how you plug this in, here's how you plug that in, and here's the volume. So this is a little bit comparable to what you might get from a spouse or a son or a daughter, or the person in the store who just sold you the thing. Right? So this is what I call a mini intervention. There's nothing professional about it. So we have our normals, we have a vision impaired group, we have the dual group, we have the repeat group that we come to in a second. And they were more or less very well balanced actually. Of course the normals had better acuity. Uh, there was no difference in the hearing loss on the hearing scales. And it turns out that 46 of them passed the MOCA and 26 of them failed the MOCA, but otherwise they were relatively balanced across the group, so we just decided to throw it all in the same bag because it turns out actually in this, in this context, failing the MOCA didn't matter. So the tasks were easy enough that you can do this even if you may be at risk for a mild impairment. So, here is the percentage of people that were able to do the task as instructed on the pocket talker the first time around and then after what we call our mini intervention. So it turns out the first piece is that all our intervention groups got better after we showed them what to do, uh, except the control group. There was one person who couldn't do it the second time around. It actually turned out that she set the volume to the wrong number, but we decided mm, this is a mistake, so there it is. So everybody got better. This is good news. You know, even a mini intervention will increase it. It's also bad news because nobody, none of those groups made it up to 100%. Right? So there's 
obviously a certain level of success that you can have with a mini intervention, but you can't take it up to what it should be. If we look at the telephone condition, we get exactly the same pattern, but the values are up overall. Could you guess why? This is something that everybody has done before in their life. They know how to use a phone. But a pocket talker is new. Right? This is all different. And so here the success rate was a little lower overall. Then we decided, all right, I'm not asking you to understand this table. I don't barely understand this table. But what we were curious at is if we now look at things that we know about these people, can I predict from what I knew from them before they arrived in the room of who will succeed and who won't. And so the story here is that we looked at their age, their pegboard scores, their acuity, their MOCA score. And to sum this up, what basically happened here is that if you have a risk factor, so to speak, in any one of them, that may not be such a bad deal. But the moment two of them come together, success rates go down. So if you're just old, or if you just have poor acuity, or if you just have a poor dexterity score, yeah, you'll handle it. But the moment two of them or three of them come together, then we're in trouble. Which goes back to this idea that this is a complicated and a complex population, and the ones that are more complicated are more at risk. So then we looked at speed. We asked them to do the task, and we timed them. So what we have here is the precondition. So the Walter out of the box condition, in this case, assemble the pocket talker, go. So the normals do this in anywhere between 10 and 20 seconds. And it takes between 40 and 50 seconds. Doesn't matter whether you have a vision loss only or a vision and a hearing loss. These people behave the same way. And it turns out after the mini demonstration, they all got better. Great. Also, our normals got better. Makes sense. This is simply the effect of experience, of doing something. Uh, sorry, this is the effect of strategy. Because right? we now showed you what to do. You can apply that. You get better at it. Of course, the problem with that is that you're not only applying a strategy, but you're also doing it a second time. So you have practice and strategy together. That doesn't help me, because I would really like to know what is the effect of the strategy? Because that is why we are rehabilitation professionals. If we don't need that, then we'll just send people home and have them do it a couple of times. They'll figure it out. Huh? So we created the repeat group. And so with these people, we showed them right away how this works. And then we just had them do it again. Turns out, if you show people right away, they perform at the same speed as somebody who has received this intervention later. But somebody who has gotten this intervention right away and repeats it gets even faster and gets to a level that is statistically actually identical to the precondition in our normally cited group. So this is huge news because this means that you can actually, with a mini intervention, by a non-professional rehabilitation specialist. Bring people back to a behavior speed here that is comparable to normals. Of course, the problem here is this didn't work for everybody. Huh? And so what's fascinating now is that maybe there might be an idea for a triage. When people come into the system, if they have things that we can easily solve, that they get moved this way to have mini interventions to see what happens. Whereas if people arrive and this is clear this is not a mini intervention thing, this is where we invest the time for trained and certified rehabilitation professionals. Because right now everybody's seeing everybody. Right? So I'm not saying that I'm here to convince you of this, you know, but this is the researcher in me says, hmm, I wonder. Resources are being cut all over the place. What could I do to still get a lot of bang for very little buck on a mini intervention side and then focus my real trained staff on bringing everybody else up to 100%? If we look at the telephone situation, the pattern is exactly the same, only the effect is smaller because this is a device that people are more familiar with. Therefore, there is less to gain because they're already a lot better 
see here this is 25 seconds to do this this is not a big waste of time but we can still bring all of this down rather quickly so when we looked at this question of you know, how many people can actually do this this proportion of people that can handle such a task it can be as low as 20% if they don't have any training, practice, if it's a complicated task, and if they have both impairments. But it can be as high as 95% if it is an easy, familiar task, if this is a common device, and if you only give a brief instruction. So this is a big difference in the load that you potentially create in terms of work for somebody. When we look at the client characteristics, any one of them alone, you know, cause a little bit of trouble, but if you combine them, things become more complicated. Not just for them, but also for you, of course, as, a, as an intervention person, because you have to consider more than two or three variables at the, team, at the same time. And if we look at uh, the speed itself, a brief explanation will already improve success, but it turns out that practice has a separate beneficial effect to this but not for everybody and not under all circumstances. So we'll see where this goes over time. What I would really like to do is now do this with a larger number of people, also do this with different devices, maybe devices that are more complicated to handle. And we're also now starting to reverse this. I've got a student who will do a project this year to look at the audibility of low vision devices that talk to you because this is the same problem, right? We're going to have older adults that want to use a scanner and a talking scale and a talking clock and God knows what. But if that thing talks to you and you can't hear what they're saying, it's not going to be very useful. So will, do these devices allow you to change the speech signal? It's not just a question of cranking the volume, but you may want to slow it down. You may want to make the sound more crisp. This is not necessarily something that every uh, device will allow you. So that's where we're trying to go next. And I'm very curious over time whether people show interest in this idea of a mini-intervention. The way this is traditionally called is para-professionals. Right? You have OT assistants and you have O&M assistants. And not everybody is into that. Right? This, is, uh, this is what I mean with thin ice. Not everybody really wants that territorial war to go on. And I wonder whether we need to rethink that, given the fact that everything is becoming ex more expensive. So we may, this may be actually a solution and a tool for some of the services that we provide. Cool. Now the question that rises out of all of this is, OK, we now know who you are. We now know what you are doing with this device. But do you actually want to use this device? And so this is where I'm sort of venturing slowly into my psychosocial path. Um, we did something called a public discourse analysis. Uh, the way um, we address this is that there's sort of a general, um, what is the perception of people out there that have a dual sensory loss? And how, how do we deal with this? As a rehabilitation professional, we have our own stereotypes, which we can get to a little later. But also the people that come to us will bring their own stereotypes. And so we somehow need to manage this. So what we ended up, this is also you know, for your detailed reading in your package in case you want to go there. And it's going to be no surprise that, of course, aging, sensory loss, all of this has all sorts of topics that are touched, whether this is the social emotional well-being of the person. We've talked a little bit about cognition already, uh, independence. And I find in independence is an interesting topic because sometimes independence becomes linked to isolation. Because people become more independent, which suddenly removes them from some of the people that used to help them. And they were not just helpers, but they were also a social support group and their friends. And so this, you know, it's tricky when your intervention person also becomes your best friend. I see this a lot that people come in for their annual checkup, <laughs> and I'm the first person they've spoken to this month because they're otherwise, you know, living independently. That's tricky. Uh, just for, for the fun of it, I actually have a colleague next door who is visually impaired who talks to me a lot about how the internet and the accessibility of assistive devices has changed her life. She is in touch with everybody. And she can communicate through Facebook. And she does all of this. 
And once in a while she realizes that she has spent the last seven evenings at home, online, alone. So she's connected to everybody, but she's completely isolated because there's no need to leave the house anymore. And so she's herself, she's employed, she's engaged, but she sees how seductive this can be to use all of this accessibility and all these possibilities. And it actually does exactly the opposite of what she wants because she wants to be out there and she wants to reconnect and all of that. She wants to be physically more active so she doesn't you know, gain weight and all of that. But there is this thing that you can just turn on and it's completely accessible and it will talk to you and it, you know, it will get you in touch. And she's caught between this right now and I'm sure she's not the only one. Uh, health and mortality are affected by sensory loss. That is no news either. Uh, the risk for falls is higher. You know, um, it's not just because of the visibility of things. The balance system is close to the hearing system. So there are issues with balance and hearing loss that are emerging more and more. So that's to be considered. This is a very fragile population. And lots can go wrong. Uh, there are obvious issues in communication. Not just with your rehabilitation professional, but with anybody in the end. With your neighbor, with your grocer. So not everybody is able to overcome communication, and we'll come back to this a little bit later. So the aspect that I found very fascinating in this is this idea of stigma and the idea of stereotypes as uh, sort of an underlying cause. And uh, what are we doing? So I, I went and I talked to some of my rehab colleagues, and I said, so how do you address stigma in your rehabilitation intervention? And there was nothing. This doesn't really come up. Right? It's not that we are trained in a way to say, now, what, how, what, how am I going to overcome a stereotype? You know? Sometimes it becomes a question of, do we bring in a social worker? Uh, well, you know, great, but you know, then it becomes sort of a thing. You know? Suddenly, you're calling upon a health professional. And there is stigma attached with that itself. Right? So it becomes a little tricky. And I was curious you know, how, how this is dealt with. Then, of course, one of the issues that ties into the population I'm working with is aging itself. And this is where you know, it's interesting for us, for each of you, to actually examine your own stereotypes. Now, let me tell you this. It is completely normal for all of us to see life through a certain lens, your personal lens. And we all have our stereotypes. I'm not going to ask you now to come out and tell me what your stereotypes are. But I will ask you what things come to mind besides what's on the slide here that you would see to be, or that you would think to be, a common stereotype about older adults with dual sensory loss. Anything. What comes to mind? And I'm not saying these are yours. It's just what people think, you know? People say. Slow and active, making mistakes. I like that. Mistakes making. Anything else? So again? Oh, interesting. I like this one. Some of them actually have clued into the fact that they need to push a little bit to get what they need. So they're viewed as, oh, her. Yeah, she pushes. Huh? <laughs> Other things that you've had in your clinic where you go, oh, it's one of those. Huh? Engineers? Yeah, so their work, what they do previously, in their employment. Like our CPAs and engineers, I, I mean, yesterday she said, I got this person, blah, 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 and I said, oh, were they a CPA? Oh, so you will actually group them by their history. Yeah. So this is what you used to be, and therefore you must be that way. <laughs> yeah, I like that. That's interesting. That's cool. <laughs> Other things that pop to mind? Skeptical. Oh, that's interesting. Distrustful. Um, ah. What's interesting about skeptical and distrustful is that that may actually directly be linked to the sensory loss. Because if they are missing information here and there, they may not trust what has come in. But they may actually re project that out and therefore not trust you. You see how that could work? So stereotypes are actually huge and present every single day in everything we do. 
But I find it fascinating how little time we actually spend thinking about that. I have various stereotypes that, you know, I think, all right, all people are this way and they're that way. And some of them are actually really more based about my perception of my parents and my grandparents. It's got nothing to do with old people. It's just got to do with the old people I know really well. And some of them I don't like very well. <laughs> so I need to overcome that. But this is really work that I need to do by myself at home. It has nothing to do with my clients. But this is not necessarily something that we as a field are often reflecting upon. Where do I actually stand when it comes to culture and sexuality and religion? And well, some of these things are very much on the table every day because they're political hot topics. But the stereotypes associated with aging, they're not necessarily front page news right now, but they should be for those who work with this population. Because I guarantee you that if you face some of your own demons this way, you don't have to overcome them, but you just need to know, oh, I wonder, maybe I'm doing this because that's what I'm doing. Right? It may change the way you provide your services. Uh, so I'll let you play with that. Um, and you don't need to go into therapy for that. I think this, <laughs> this is really something that you can do by yourself. It's, it's just think about how you are with this once in a while and if that is worthwhile reflecting upon. So some of the things, of course, that are reported in other places is that, you know, there is a lot of weakness and frailty. We associate disability with aging. I actually find it very interesting that many times we see the aging population as a burden on our health system. But that's not actually as accurate as we think it is because uh, nobody has ever said that pregnant women that give birth are a burden on the health system, but they do use it. Right? There's a lot of things that are completely normal to us in life that will require a little bit of help from the health system. Uh, we don't perceive children with disability the same way as a burden as we would with older people. And it's very interesting how we create that depending on how it suits us. So, something to think about. There is general, generally greater value given to people that have no impairments. We also give greater value to people that are younger. There is a very fascinating study where they actually asked a group of uh, people across the age range to judge the grief that they would feel if somebody would die at a specific age in life. And so we feel less grief if this person is over 85. We actually, interesting, feel less grief if this is a pre-birth death, if this is a stillbirth, or if this birth, uh, if the death occurs very early on in life. And that's because there hasn't, there's been less attachment, right? because it's so early. But there is sort of a curve that is created that actually mirrors the reproductive ability of people. So we mourn people most when they die at a point in their life where their reproductive ability is highest. Which is interesting when you look at the response to Orlando, for example, because most of the people in there fall into uh, age range that is the peak of their reproductive life. And so the outburst mirrors that. And it's very interesting to see that there seems to be a link to that, maybe evolutionary, who knows? You know, the, the justification for this is difficult. But when we look at aging, you know, there, you, we see how there's less value attached in general to people that are older. Also what I find interesting is the idea of visibility, you know, that this goes sort of contrary to the demographics I showed you earlier, where there are more and more older people, but they become less and less visible. Because we've got places where they live. Right? This is where you go to that place. Uh, there's this advertisement in uh, Quebec that everybody can sing for you on the street. It's called Residence du Soleil, and it's uh, the, the, the sun homes. Right? So this is where you go to look at the sunset. And, uh, this is where people go. They go into the, the Residence Soleil when they get older. So we, we make them less visible. They're less in the way, right? They're, there we can take care of them. So what we ended up wanting to study in this context is how we talk about this. 
specifically how we talk about this in the media. And we chose print media. There's a newspaper in Canada called the Globe and Mail. It's an English newspaper that is sold coast to coast to coast. And uh, we searched in that newspaper for language on how people with dual sensory impairment are discussed. How do we talk about them? So this is an image of the Globe and Mail. The Globe and Mail has something called Factiva. It's a database that you can search like PubMed, but it will only search the content of this newspaper. And so we created a, a series of search strings about sensory impairment and technology, deaf and blind, old and disabled, that kind of stuff. And uh, then we decided to do a discourse analysis of the texts of the articles that are written in this journal, in this, in this newspaper. In order for an article to be included, there had to be a mention of some kind of stereotype. There had to also be a link to a health condition in this case. We decided to open the door a little further, not just vision and hearing, but there are many other things that are associated to aging. aging. So we're curious about that. And it had to be specifically in the context of aging. If there was a mention of assistive technology, all the better. We went there. Now. We ended up coding the text itself into th information about a health condition, whether that is vision or hearing or something else. Also, in which context is this article written? Are we looking about something that is informing us about policy, or is it a gossip piece, or is it something in the arts and culture section? Uh, we were looking specifically at what kind of stereotype is mentioned or maintained, and what are the consequences of this stereotype? What, where would that lead us within the context of the article? So, uh, you know, the coding itself, sentence, the, the unit of the coding was the sentence that is really more a methodological thing. So we went through almost 9,000 articles uh, in a period of four, diff four years that we selected until 2014. Uh, and we ended up choosing 66 articles that really somehow touched one of the topics that we were interested in. So here is what we ended up finding. These are the stereotypes that are being discussed in Canada's largest news newspaper. Incompetence. And this is sort of the one thing that pops up as being endorsed within the context of what is written. We only found five articles where they are actually arguing against it. So you'll see articles that maintain and promote that stereotype, and others that are trying to break it down. And you will see that the break it down number is generally smaller. Uh, people talk about inevitable decline, the economic burden. This comes back to the idea of the health system. Aging is a lost cause. These are freaks. They're vulnerable. They're worthless. It gets fun. Uh, this is very scary when you think about this. But this is how information is being presented. Now, one of the reasons we chose newsprint it's because that remains the number one news source for older adults. Many of them will not go online to find their news. They will still want to read their newspaper. So this is really how they perceive people talk about them. Right? So this is an effect that goes in multiple directions. It will actually make older adults think that this is the truth. And it will tell younger adults that this is OK. And that's really a problem. When we look at the health conditions that are mentioned, the large majority that maintain these types of stereotypes refer to mental health. Since cognition is a big topic, and I think also because people, care providers, family members are often more worried about this threat of cognitive decline, this is a big part of the discussion. Uh, there's a lot of information out there about multiple chronic conditions. You know, people talk about the fact that not one impairment appears alone. This comes up in the context of disability. And it turns out, actually, vision and hearing show up in the top seven. So they, they did come out. When we look at the context, most of these articles were done in the context of policy, health care, uh, funding, that kind of stuff. Uh, there are some pieces about asking for help. These are self-help sections in the newspaper where uh, advice is provided. Uh, there were articles about assistive technologies and employment and independence, kind of stuff. So I wanted to show you a couple of examples. What does that actually look like? Of what is OK, this is how I want to present this, of what is OK to write in a newspaper? Because really, one of my messages 
We've actually contacted the Globe and Mail with this study as well to raise awareness with them about what they are perpetuating. So here is uh, an example where we're looking at the context of hearing loss. And the context is somebody traveling alone on an airplane. And the stereotype that is being maintained is that you know, these people are all the same. Sometimes that means I'll be met at my destination by a smiling woman holding a sign with my name on it and a wheelchair. I've yet to figure out why my deafness renders me unable to walk. So I thought that this was really fascinating because I, you see this a lot. Right? You get on a plane, and of course, when you get out of the plane, there's this little army of people with wheelchairs waiting for what we think is the older gang right? that need to be taken to their luggage and all of that. So if you are somebody who is deaf, it's kind of rough if you're met with a wheelchair. So I called a friend of mine who works for Air Canada, and I said, explain this to me. So I learned something really interesting. Turns out, if you have an impairment, you have a disability, and you choose to book an airline ticket, and you choose to declare your disability, for whatever reason, you may need some, somebody to communicate with when you get there, if you're deaf. Or you might want to advise them that the person who's sitting in 13A doesn't speak English because they signed. Right? So this might be a useful piece to have in case of emergency for the airplane. So you have declared your disability. You show up. You're deaf. Uh, you get checked in. Maybe a friend helps you. You're on the plane and all of course. So you've done this booking. This booking is done through what is called the medical office. And the medical office at Air Canada has a code for wheelchair, for mobility impairment, for deafness, for blindness, for you name it. This is a whole selection. And you can be coded with any and all of these things. You can be as impaired as you want. And each of them will trigger a different kind of adaption. And if they actually have a flight attendant that signs, this will be, you will be notified. You know, so all of this is done. Great. Everybody's happy. If you have a flight, like for example, me coming to Wichita, my flight from Montreal to Chicago is with Air Canada, and all of this information is maintained. The moment I switch to United to come to Wichita, all of this information is lost and reduced to one code that is called disabled. So now you have somebody in Wichita says, oh, look, we've got two people arriving with disability. What do you do? You show up prepared for everything because you have no idea what the disability is. And so the key thing you bring along is a wheelchair. If the person is motor impaired, you have what you need. If the person is blind, excellent. Put them in the chair, take them where they need to go. Go so much faster. <laughs> if the person is deaf, same thing. You don't need to communicate with them. You put them in a chair and you take them where they need to go because that'll be quicker than trying to explain to them where they need to go. So this is all about efficiency. It has nothing to do with anything negative. It's all about getting the job done. But nobody ever explained that to a user. And I would even say that some people would accept that if they would know why that happens. But just arriving, being deaf and not you know, being faced with that wheelchair, I can see that being harsh. Please, go ahead. Yes. I have seen a uh, sort of a, a migration of views among at least blind and multiply disabled blind people on that uh, issue. Uh, and one of the things that I do as an O&M person is uh, teach people airport travel and mm -hmm. uh, changing planes, stuff like that. And the view used to be, oh dear, they showed up with a wheelchair again. Now I've got to explain to them, no, put that away. I need sighted guide. Yes. But you miss a few planes on a tight connection because the person is uncomfortable with sighted guide. Suddenly you develop the view Okay, if they want to put me in a wheelchair and get me to the damn flight in time, that's yeah. a good thing. Yeah, I actually so, I so fully agree. Everybody laughed in the room, which is what made me raise my hand when you said the person's blind and they show up with a wheelchair. Some of the people that I'm working with currently say, oh, thank goodness I'm going to get there this way, you know. Yes, in time, exactly. So in the end, you know, depending on what you really... Are you more concerned about getting the job done, or are you going to be more concerned about what it feels like? 
Right? So this is sort of a, a balance that everybody has to strike for themselves. I'll show you another example that I really like. So here we're also talking about hearing loss and asking for help. Uh, and they're all the same. When I ask for this visible alarm, so now you know that these light, one uh, hearing device, for example, is that instead of having an alarm that vibrates, you can have an alarm that has a light on it. Uh, I'm often put in a special all-purpose handicapped room, complete with a gigantic bathroom with a low toilet, grab bars everywhere, large print signage, and extra wide doors. One size fits all, deaf, mobility impaired, blind, whatever. And again, this is not intended to insult the person with the disability. This is intended for the hotel to be able to live up to the adaptation and accessibility requirements that they have to accommodate to be able to be in business. But you know, the effect may not always be the same. Some people may, it actually has happened to me once that I arrived, I checked in very late and the only room that was available was the disabled room. And so I didn't have actually a wall between my bedroom and the bathroom, but I had a huge curtain. And you know, I, I could dance in that shower. I mean, it was, it was ridiculous. <laughs> but it was the only room that was left, and you know, so I have room to dance in the shower. I didn't really mind. But I can see that if you are already dealing with other stereotypes that may be related to your own disability, you may be more sensitive to these kind of issues. Here's another one that I thought was quite stunning. As her vision faded, Miss Burke started using a white cane, something that left her friends embarrassed. The bullying began, invitations dried up, and some people told her to kill herself. She got a guide dog, hoping it would draw people in where the cane had driven them away. So let's just start out with the fact that this is written in a newspaper, OK? <laughs> okay oh, wow. That's uh, yeah, all right, we've got work to do. So we definitely have work to do. Now, great, we're raising awareness, OK? But we need to break this down a little bit. And I find this fascinating here, actually, to look specifically at the mobility component of dog versus cane. Because I'm sort of looking at the, the situation in Montreal. If you're on St. Catherine Street, you've got thousands of people on a sidewalk. Somebody shows up with a white cane, the parting of the Red Sea. And uh, you can easily move down the street. But of course, again, it will contribute to your social isolation because you're going to meet nobody. I have friends that will consciously pull out their guide dog in order to meet people. And they will even risk the fact that the, their dog training suffers a little bit by people coming up and pet the thing. But the thing is that suddenly people are drawn to them because they want to meet the dog. They meet the person by default. And suddenly, friendships are formed, and communication is open. And then you have to spend another three hours retraining the dog afterwards. <laughs> but they are willing to make that sacrifice for a psychosocial benefit to be considered. You know? And so if you're an older person now, and this, you read this, and you go, oh my god, right? this is my future. So this, this needs to be presented in a very specific context so people can understand this and that these stereotypes don't get out of control. Here is my favorite one. We called it the golden quote of all our analyses because it really came the closest to what we were trying to study. My golden age has slowly turned into a Band-Aid age. The magnifying glass became quite useful. So that was her Band-Aid number one. The eyesight and the hearing diminished. The cataract was removed. So here, the surgical intervention was a Band-Aid. So I gave myself the push, and I asked for Band-Aid number seven, a hearing aid. People tell me I look well rested and have not changed a bit. I don't tell friends about the Band-Aids I use them. Ah. And I'm going, what a beautiful opportunity for being a role model, and no. Because stigma took over, and so she chose to hide. She has the success, but she is not willing to be a role model to show that other people could have a similar success if they would engage in those band-aids. Right? In the end, if we would have people like that that can stand up and live it, successfully in the public eye. I always find it interesting how few role models we actually have in the celebrity circle, you know, people that are out there willing to speak up for this. Very interesting article a while ago about Dame Judi Dench and her macular degeneration and 
how that changed her acting career and how she needed to have people read text in recordings so she could memorize her lines and all that stuff. But it took her a long time because she was very afraid that that may change her employment. Because why would you hire an actress that's going to run into the furniture? Right? So again, stigma, right? The stigma is immediately inserted. So a few conclusions. So we found actually overall in the entire search very little that addressed our research aspects of our question. And so there's a, there's a television show in Quebec called Tout le monde en parle. This means everybody is talking about it. And it's a show that's on every Sunday night where they talk about current stuff. No doubt this Sunday they will talk about Brexit. So that's the kind of stuff that is on the table that is current that people need to know about. This is sort of our science version of what are people talking about. And it turns out we're not talking about this enough. I think that part of our professional responsibility also is to bring this up whenever we can. Because like I told you in the demographics part, the wave hasn't even started coming. These are still the parents of the baby boomers. It's interesting that older adults will recognize the benefit of their devices, but they are reluctant to disclose that they're using them. We have that one example, but there are many others. The fact that hearing aids are beige, I think, is, you know, drives the whole point home. There was this movement a while ago to use Bluetooth hearing aids that look like cellular phones that you can clip into the ear. There's the nerd factor. I'm not entirely sure that this will work for everyone. This may work for geeks and nerds that have become 75. <laughs> and honestly, I could see it work for me. I think that I. I would be somebody, when I grow older, who might have uh, a fancy kind of hearing aid like this that also doubles as a telephone. Why not? Right? But this may not be for everybody. It may not go well with an evening gown. Right? So who knows? Negative disclosures in the media may really contribute to how we view all of this as a society. I think in this case, we're looking at print media, but I think this is world well worth looking at how things are portrayed on television, for example. Uh, I dare you name a TV character in a television show right now that has a hearing loss. Right? This is tough. This is not how we present, you know, how we present people. It's not accepted, it's not incorporated. If I ask you to name a TV show that has a gay character in it, that's easier. Right? That took a long time to get there, and now this is all much more incorporated into society. But in terms of aging and sensory loss, we still have far to go, because it's not part of mainstream. And it should be, really. Public education is part of this. I think that uh, we talked yesterday about children, uh, about interventions with children, but I think that also education is going to be huge. I think the next generation is going to deal with all of this very, very differently. Also, I think assistive devices will be viewed differently, especially if we can make devices like the iPad a rehab device. So may, you may use the same device all your life. It's just its functionality changes. That is cool. Because suddenly you've overcome a stigma barrier, and you have normalized the device itself by its regular functioning. We're, we're doing various things right now of how you can actually provide auditory access through Bluetooth hearing aids through the iPad because they can talk to each other. So there are things that are coming that will be sexy. Things to remember from today before I go into some of the practical stuff. The large majority of the people that you will see in dual sensory loss rehab are going to be older people. Uh, it turns out that even little stuff with them will make a big difference. Not for everybody, as I discussed earlier. But this is interesting that you can actually have quick moments of success. I wonder if you can maximize on that as well. Because if you can establish a successful relationship on a mini intervention very early on, it will probably improve the probability of this person coming back to you for something else. So if you can solve small problems like this very easily, they will see the benefit of your intervention. And they will also see why they just paid 15 or 35 bucks an hour for whatever it is you're doing with them. Be a role model. I think that in the end, uh, if we can stand up, speak up, and show people what we do and how, how this can really change somebody's lives, or our own, you know, for the people that have a sensory impairment that are living it, 
try not to hide it. I think that there's something to be proud about to have overcome whatever you have overcome. I mean, in this crowd, you know, there are not that many people here today that have a sensory loss. But I've given this a similar talk at a retirement home a while ago where I asked everybody to raise their hand who was wearing a hearing aid. And it was almost the entire room. But some people turned to us, I had no idea you have a hearing aid, because people were hiding it. Right? And if you have longer hair, if there are you know, other ways of, of not coming out as being disabled, people will take that route. And I don't think it's always necessary. I actually started a conversation a while ago with somebody on the subway, because the gentleman who sat down pulled out his road map and then pulled out this huge magnifier and started going through this. And I'm going, OK, well, you've got the wrong magnification. But you know, <laughs> here you are with your magnifier. Bigger, in this case, is not better. We talked a little bit about this, but I complimented him on the fact that he is doing this. He says, well, this is how I'm getting my stuff done. I said, good for you. you know. But he didn't care anymore. I've also had a, a client a little while ago who says, you know, I'm 97. I really don't care what I look like anymore. And that can work in your benefit, right? Because suddenly you can plan an intervention without having to worry about stigma. But for that, you have to establish that relationship first to be able to judge whether stigma will interfere with your intervention or not. So now I wanted to dig something out here. I'm guessing now that the majority of the people in the room are more familiar with vision interventions. Is that right? You're coming more from the low vision blindness rehab world, more so than the hearing world. Is anybody in the room actually trained in hearing interventions? No. So this article, I think, is worth digging out. Uh, it's an article that talks about things you might want to know or do in the context of hearing if hearing is not your business. And so some of the things I wanted to walk through with you today just for the practical implications of your own clinic. Uh, you may not notice this having normal hearing, but we can hear the air conditioner. Right? To us, this is maybe not a big deal. But for somebody with a mild hearing loss, this will block quite a bit of perception. So this is actually quite noisy. If you can create an environment for your treatments, where noise is reduced as much as possible, that will make a difference. In that context, uh, you don't necessarily want to start screaming at people, but you do want to be closer to them, because it will uh, provide a better auditory signal. So closeness, uh, it's interesting because you also need to develop a little bit of an interpersonal relationship in order to be that close. But I think that in vision rehab, many times, that door is already open because people are actually used to the fact that you get close to their eyes. Why not get close to their ears while they are there, right? So in the end, that, that's not such a big barrier. This is maybe a bigger barrier for people that work in physical rehabilitation, in motor rehab, because they're not necessarily that close in the space of the person. So get closer, get personal. Make sure that you face these people when you communicate with them. Uh, there's a lot of information in the face that is uh, useful in communication in terms about the lips, the jaws, the way you're expressing emotions in your posture. So it turns out, uh, in yonder olden days, there was a perception in the hearing world that if your vision is beyond 2200, that speech reading and lip reading is actually not going to fly anymore because there's not enough contrast usually and not enough uh, low spatial frequency information in the face anymore for you to be benefiting from communication. Well, it turns out somebody unleashed some researchers on this question. And it turns out that even up to 2400 and beyond, there is benefit to be had from face-to-face -face communication. And a lot of that is about body posture and about head positioning, even though they may not see the details of the lips anymore. But there is information about the tempo. There may be information in the hands about speaking that will help you with the rhythm of a sentence. Because many people, I, I talk with my hands all the time. So this will follow the structure of what you're saying. And it helps people understand what's going on. So 
a lot of people, like I say, start screaming, and that can actually be just as painful for them as it would be if that person is screaming at you. So screaming is really not the idea. You want to do two things. You want to slow down your speech a little bit. Now, not necessarily like you would on a tape that is slowed down, but you want to give time in between the things that you are saying so they can separate what belongs together. You also want to make sure that you uh, use something that's called clear speech. So you don't want to change how you talk. You don't want to go into baby talk. That, but it's fascinating how, how often I see this, in, especially in retirement homes, in old air care, in long-term care, in hospital settings, that these older people are treated like, you know, it's all gone. But it turns out that comprehension is best when you communicate with them as you always would have. You just need to slow down, maybe choose vocabulary appropriately. You don't want to go too complex. But make sure that they're with you. Also, in this context, ask them once in a while, not if they heard you, because they'll say, yes, dear. But you want to ask them, what did I say? If they can bring this back to you, then that's the only way that you know that they actually understood. They may have heard, but it may not have gone in. So the only way to know whether it went in is to ask them to repeat it. The best way and the most important place to do this is actually when you're doing an intervention about a strategy of something that they need to do, that they themselves verbally have to repeat the instructions you just gave them. Because that's the only way you will know that it actually made it into the system. This I always found very interesting. You might want to start out by assuring that they are with you and that they know what this is about. So instead of starting with what we're going to, you know, that, that this becomes something complex all right, already, that you start out with, you know, the CCTV. Ah, so now if we have attention, they now know, OK, whatever comes now has to do with the CCTV. So they can anticipate the kind of content you're talking about, the kind of vocabulary that you might be using in this context. And it'll help them to guess whatever it is that they missed. Like I said, shouting, not a good idea, not useful. Uh, some of you may wonder, well, you know, I don't know whether my people have a hearing loss or no. Uh, the first question that I would pose here is, ask them. Uh, I mean, that sounds rather silly, but that is actually not such a bad idea. The ones that are already accepting their hearing loss will tell you this. It will immediately change your interaction. The ones that haven't accepted it may not have heard your question. Right, so this is already an open door. If you want to be more systematic about it, in your package online is a hearing screening questionnaire called the Do You Hear Well? Uh, it exists in English. It exists in French. In case you ever want that, just email me. I'll send it to you. Uh, Something that is unfortunate about this questionnaire is that it is validated, but the validation was never published. So there, at the bottom of the questionnaire that I left with you, you will find the information about the people who did validate this in case you would ever need to cite that. But that's sort of a piece of information that kind of got lost. So those are sort of the two things I would say for screening that might be useful. A couple of other things is that you want to simply allow more time I think that that's, uh, no matter what you're doing, don't rush them through it. Uh, in general, always a good idea to avoid any kind of clutter and noise that could be zooming around. If you have care providers in the room, you may actually have to ask them to shut up and also not to answer for them because they will deal with their own stigma and their own stereotypes. They may think they're doing you a favor by getting the show on the road but you are losing a lot of information that you need because it's all in this, like the intake process will provide you a lot of information about their functionality. However, if you have them there, it's great to use them as some type of assistive or rehab device because there will be things that you can have followed up, especially in the communication department, through the people that do most of the communicating. 
And then we will hear more about this in a moment. But I think that the question of having friends in the fields that, in, that are related is super important. In your little smartphone, you should have sort of a, a sub-call group of, this is my standard ophthalmologist, my standard optometrist, my standard audiologist, my standard speech and language pathologist. You should really know at least one of these everywhere you are, because you will come across stuff that goes beyond what you do. And so that is when you pull in your team. And your clients will thank you for it. 